Detroit Economic Club this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, people ask me, how big a deal is it to give a speech to the Detroit Economic Club? And I say it's such a big deal that I gave so many speeches and interviews saying I was going to give the speech that I lost my voice. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. It is a big deal to be here. And I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. There was a little girl. Uh, you may have heard about her. She wanted $100, and she, she decided she'd write a note to God. She said, dear God, would you send me $100? I'll do good things with it. So postman got the postmaster got the letter and he didn't know what to do with it, so he sent it to the president. The president said, "Well, that's cute. Why don't you send uh, send to the secretary? Said, Why don't you send her five dollars? She'll think that's a lot of money." So she gets the five dollars and she's like, "But her parents said always send a thank you when you receive a gift. Always send a thank you." So she said, "Dear God, thanks for the money, but..." You know, next time, don't send it through Washington. They stole 95% of it. <laughs> now, really, I could just stop there, because that's essentially the plan, I'm going to tell you. But it is an honor to be here in Detroit. I want to thank uh, Beth for making things work, making the trains run on time, and uh, for giving us this opportunity to speak. I'd like to thank Dottie for introducing me and for uh, letting us be part of this, for uh, GOP Chairman Bobby Shostag for helping organize and getting us to Detroit and to Michigan again. I think when, you know, when I started thinking about this speech, I said, well, we need to find out something great that's going on in Detroit. We don't want to hear any doom and gloom. So I was looking for somebody that said something nice, and I had this great thing by Jack White. And then I thought I'd have to sing it, and it just wasn't going to go over that well. But I did find a young intern at Quicken Loans, and her name is Lisa Schlossberg. And she wrote in one of their magazines, she says, I found out the truth about Detroit. It's unstoppable. Not because it's wealthy, powerful, and growing, because it isn't. Detroit is unstoppable because the people here cannot be stopped. The citizens of this city are the light at the end of the tunnel, the one man left standing, the underdog who actually wins. They are optimism, promise, potential, and hope. Optimism is bringing this city back. This city isn't afraid of opportunity. It's not discouraged by its past. It's excited about its future. I just love the way she put that, a young woman who really believes and is optimistic about the future for Detroit. But you know, one thing is certain, Detroit's future and Lisa's future will not come from Washington. The magic of Motown is here in the city. It's not in some central planner's notebook. What Detroit needs to thrive is not Washington's domineering hand, but freedom from big government's mastery. To thrive, Detroit needs less government and more freedom. Less red tape, less punitive taxes, more money left in Detroit. The answer to poverty and unemployment is not another government stimulus. It's simply leaving more money in the hands of those who earned it. Today, I'm here to introduce something I call economic freedom zones. This is a bill that will be introduced next week in Washington. These freedom zones will dramatically reduce taxes and red tape so Detroit businesses can grow and thrive. Freedom zones are similar to an idea Jack Kemp introduced a couple of decades ago. Kemp loved figuring out ways to empower people, real people, regardless of race or family background. He called his plan a conservative war on poverty. It's time we revisit some of these ideas of Jack Kemp and expand upon them. I told somebody recently, this is Jack Kemp's enterprise zones on steroids. The bill that I'll introduce will introduce these and empower and begin these economic freedom zones. This bill will lower personal and corporate income taxes in Detroit to 5%. My bill will also lower the payroll tax, 2% for the employees, 2% for the employers. Economic freedom zones will cut out the red tape that keeps new businesses from starting and old businesses from thriving. Inside these zones, we'll suspend the capital gains tax, encourage greater investment in business and real estate, and we will allow all small businesses to deduct most of what they invest in the first year of the purchase. How will this differ from a, con a traditional government stimulus? Well, first, these zones don't ask Houston 
or they don't ask Atlanta to bail out Detroit. These zones free up Detroit to bail themselves out. This isn't just about Detroit. I'm a politician, so I'm also concerned about my home. We're concerned about Kentucky. We're concerned about any zip code with unemployment greater than one and a half times the average. So right now, any community in America with 12% approximately or more would be eligible for these freedom zones. So this would be struggling communities across America. It would include many in my home state. There are 20 counties in the eastern part of my state that are in a depression right now. So it's not just Detroit that's struggling. We're struggling in my state, too. But freedom zones differ from traditional government stimulus in that no central planner, no politician in Washington will decide who gets the money. The money will simply be left with its rightful owner, the man or the woman who by sweat equity earned it. The freedom zone stimulus will work where traditional government stimulus hasn't worked because the government stimuluses that we've had, the money gets passed out to special interests. And those who give you campaign contrib contributions, they get the money. But it's not based on whether they can do anything or they could run a business. Those are the people that get the stimulus money. In this plan, the money will stay with the people that consumers have already voted for. The people that democratic capitalism has already run through the gauntlet. The people have already proven that they can run a business. Too often when government picks the winners and losers, we wind up with mostly losers. Think Solyndra. Over 500 million of your dollars was given to one of the richest men in the world. Why would we be giving a loan? The president says he's for the middle class. Why would he be giving a loan to one of the richest men in the world? But it turns out people didn't want the guy's product. They didn't want these solar panels. And so it went out of business and we lost all of the money. And we're stuck with a tab. Economic freedom zones won't make that mistake. The lower taxes will benefit any business that consumers have already seen fit to endorse. Only consumer-tested winners will get the money and through their success create jobs, more jobs for the rest of us. Economic freedom zones will, over a 10-year period, if my bill were to pass, leave over $1.3 billion in Detroit. So those who say, oh, it won't work, there won't be enough money, we've calculated it. $1.3 billion stimulus, not from Houston, not from Atlanta, from you. It's your money. We're not going to take it to Washington. We'll leave it with you. How could anybody be opposed to this? <laughs> the $1.3 billion will be left and it will help to create, it'll help Detroit to thrive again, it'll create jobs here. The money won't go to my friends or President Obama's friends. It's just gonna go back to the people who earn it. It'll go to the friends of the consumer. Regulatory relief will also help create opportunity. It'll lower the opportunity cost that hold new and old businesses back and cost Detroit millions of dollars a year. If we use numbers from a similar project that happened in Maryland, I estimate that repealing some of this stormwater craziness that they're forcing every city to do would save Detroit $16.5 million a year. I'm guessing that would pay for some police protection, some fire protection, and all the basic things you want in your city. But we also want to encourage entrepreneurs, not only in Detroit, but we want people to move to Detroit from around the country and around the world. We want to allow immigration to our country with people who have capital. See, right now we're losing people. People are going to Canada because the income tax is 15%. So Canada's getting all these great entrepreneurs from around the world, and we're losing them. Why? Corporate income tax here is 35%. Economic enterprise zones would expedite these visas for people who have $50,000. Let them come to our country. Detroit doesn't need a handout. I don't think you want a handout. Just look at your history of innovation. Look at the proud history of Detroit. Look at Henry Ford, who not only produced a car that his assembly line men and women could afford to buy, he also shortened the work week and increased wages. We were the industrial giant of the world. Detroit was the greatness of America. Government didn't do this. You did this. Government didn't discover or create Motown greats like Smokey Robinson or Diana Ross. Today doesn't need to be any different. We just need to look at ourselves. We need to look in the mirror, and we need to allow ourselves the freedom to create and innovate. 
You have leaders like this. Think of innovative leaders like Dan Gilbert of Quicken Loans that are pouring their hearts and souls and money into Detroit. Quicken Loans has spent more than a billion dollars in Detroit over the last few years and moved 3,600 employees into the city, creating thousands of jobs. Quicken Loans and sister companies have 12,000 employees working in downtown Detroit. Quicken Loans is proving all the naysayers wrong. Go to Quicken Loans at Woodward Avenue and you'll get a glimpse of Detroit's future. Detroit's situation is the result of a corrupt marriage, a big government and big labor and big business that has worked against the city of Detroit for decades. The result has been a defective government, declining business sector and failing schools. I don't say this to make a partisan point. The fact is both parties are to blame. There's enough blame to go around. Both parties, Democrat and Republican, they must admit that we haven't done all we could do for the people who live in the cities, particularly Detroit. Many have said the problems we see in Detroit, well, it just means it's the end of times. So we're done for as a country. Woe is me. Let's give up. They say we can't create enough jobs. We'll never do it again. I disagree. They say the schools here will just keep getting worse. I disagree. They say the divide between rich and poor, black and white, will only grow. I disagree. All of that pessimism is wrong. I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a moment. Anywhere else, Detroit or anywhere else in the country, this is the end of times. We are the greatest country on earth and have developed so much capital because we believed in freedom and we believed in ourselves. But for this to come true again, for us to revive our cities and our economy, we have to try to do something we haven't been trying. We can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. What we need is a new vision of prosperity, one that won't leave whole communities behind. Politicians have thrown our money at problems before, the bailouts, the stimulus programs, they haven't worked. This current president gave you a trillion dollars, not Detroit, he gave the country a trillion dollars in stimulus. You divide it up and it was $400,000 per job. The unemployment numbers didn't really budge. It doesn't work. Let's try something different. We've spent unbelievable sums in money on education, yet our schools are still falling apart. Throwing more money at them is not the answer. We have to allow them to innovate. In order to change our course, we must reverse this trend towards big government. We must end corporate welfare, crony capitalism, and the limits on choice that stifle competition and education. We must encourage policies that will lift up the individual allow for creation of new jobs, improve the schools, and get us all back to work. Can't be a bailout, though. It won't work. It would just lead us further down a path of dependency, forever subjecting ourselves to half-baked ideas and mandates coming out of Washington. More jobs are only one part of this solution, though. I believe we must also show that we can build on a government that values our God-given rights of all Americans. In addition to economic freedom, though, we have to have a 21st century civil rights agenda with education, choice, voting rights, and prison reform as its foundation. No one's life should be ruined because of a youthful mistake. No one should be thrown in prison for years and decades when they haven't hurt anyone but themselves. No one should lose their voting rights because they spent time in prison. It does us no good to create jobs for young people in Detroit if they can't later get such jobs because of an out of control war on drugs. Mandatory minimum sentences that force judges to give 10 and 20, sometimes 50 year sentences for drug offenses are crazy and they've got to end. It is a human tragedy. It is an idea of justice and there need to be new voices from either party that will say it's time to change. This is why I've joined with Democrats on this. I've joined with Democrats on this. I'm working with Senator Leahy from Vermont to try to give judges more freedom, more leeway when it comes to sentencing. If it were your kid, would you want to know whether it was their first crime? Would you want to know whether there's a chance that we could rehabilitate them? Would you want to know whether it's a drug addiction problem that's a health problem and it's not going to get better in prison? Would you want to know that there might be other solutions? Nonviolent felons who serve their time should get out of prison and get back into society. They should, they should be able to get a job. They should be able to vote. They should be able to have a life and build a family. Their children should be able to look at happiness and see what comes from hard work. 
If you keep them in prison, you're just destroying their families. We all talk about the family unit, go family unit going down the drain, and yet we're preventing families from getting back together. To do this, we must address this mindset, this federal mindset that values arrest rates more than it does graduation rates. Right now, African Americans are four times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana possession. It's not because white kids in affluent suburbs aren't, aren't also smoking pot. It's just they tend to be arrested, but they don't have as good a representation, and the police tend to gravitate there because it's easier to arrest people. This has been going on for a long time. It's not on purpose. It's not in a purposeful racism, but we have a racial return on the war on drugs, and it's not fair. Minority communities are just the easiest targets for this policy. Some say, oh, that's good politics. But maybe it's bad policy, and good people suffer every day as a result. It's a policy that tears apart families and hollows out communities. And yet every day there are more victims of this overzealous federal war on drugs. It's, it's not a point of pride in this country that we now have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Incarceration rates have skyrocketed nearly 800% since 1980. The growth of federal prisoner population is unsustainable. We're spending $80 billion of your money every year to keep people locked up. Many of them who are a threat mostly to themselves and not to others. It's a terrible fact that the war on drugs, that blacks and Latinos are disproportionately incarcerated. Nearly 50 years after the fall of Jim Crow, the number one impediment to voting in our country comes from the war on drugs. In my state, you never get the, road, the right to vote back. I have a friend whose brother grew marijuana plants in college, got convicted of a felony, he still can't vote 30 years later. When he tries to get a job, he's got to check off a box that says he's a convicted felon. You see what we've done. We're destroying people's lives from the, from the very beginning. I think we should change, and we need new voices that will talk about this. Voting rights should be restored, and the policies that have brought us this injustice should be repealed. The best way to help young people, I think, though, to keep them happy, prosperous, and out of jail is through education. Education reform is a tricky business, though. It's easy to say what will work and what won't work, but I know what we have is not working. There may not be a magic bullet for this that will make our schools the best in the world again, but what we can do and what we need to do is, is to expand the options. More choices for people has to be better. I think the best way to provide education is through competition and school choice. Not just vouchers, but also charter schools. We need an all of the above strategy. Less mandates from Washington, more local control. We need to give people flexibility when it comes to where they send their kid to school. I have a friend in Kentucky, Pastor Jerry Stevenson, and he says school choice is the civil rights issue of our day. I think we might be right. Every part of the country that tries school choice or charter schools has seen benefits, especially minority communities. Too much of the time the government says that if there's a school in your district and it's a crummy school, tough luck. But I know people in Detroit have had enough of this. There was a poll not too long ago that said 80% of those parents in Detroit would have another choice, would accept it, would take another choice if it were available. Families want this freedom to choose to send their kids where they would like to send them. And I want them to have as many choices as possible. Now, I'm lucky, I live in an area where the public schools are good. I'd send my kids to public high school in Kentucky. But in my county, my kids can choose from five different high schools. They can go to any one of the five. So the schools have to compete with each other. I can't understand how anyone could be against competition or empowering parents with choice. School choice is important, but so is the freedom to innovate. You gotta get rid of these controls coming from Washington. Charter schools get rid of this top-down approach, one size fits all, mandates that come from Washington. Studies show that charter kids school learn more material at a faster rate than their counterparts. Some opponents of school choice complain, oh, they say, well, that's government money. You'd send government money to private or religious schools. I say, yeah, absolutely, but it's not the government's money. There's no such thing as government money. Is there some sort of mythological government that creates money? Oh, actually, they kind of do. <laughs> it's your money. It was taken out of your paycheck. If you want to use some of your money to send your kid to a private school, by all means, let's do it. The president does. <laughs> <laughs>
the president's rich enough to do it. He doesn't have a voucher. But for the rest of us, by the time we're done paying our taxes, we may not have enough left to send our kids to private school. Should we get some of our money back and choose where our kids go? Public, private, religious, you name it. Along with these economic freedom zones, our bill will also give federal education money to the students. Right now, there's money that comes back from the federal government that goes to poor schools. We would attach it to the kids. Don't send it to the schools. Each kid has it like a federal voucher, and they go and they take it to whichever school they want to go to. The good schools will rise up and succeed, and the bad schools will fade away. In addition, we have also have tax credits for education, $5,000 tax credit. This is a broad agenda. This is about how do we transform communities. It's going to touch everyone in this city from the first time they go to school through becoming parents through their working lives. Economic freedom zones will remove government obstacles to success. They'll provide a generation of citizens, students, workers, and job creators with a new bargain. Your government will get out of the way. It will treat you like an adult. It will treat everyone equally under the law. It will help parents control their children's future and their education. It will help creators have more jobs for more workers. It will treat you the same way it treats everyone else, no matter the color of your skin, what part of town you come from. Washington's tried it the other way. We've tried the bailouts, the excessive regulation, excessive taxation. It hasn't worked. They've tried it. It doesn't work. We'll now try a new approach. I believe you can meet your own challenges as you rebuild your city. Challenges and as you can do this, I think it will endure and prevail. And I promise you that I will work to help you do just that. Thank you very much.